And now I'm going to go ahead and share my desktop with you. So in just a moment, you're going to see your screen change over to my non-existing desktop. This is sometimes what you get when you come back from lunch. Technology for you. But the Turning Point Anywhere software, of course, is what we're talking about today. And before I open up this software, just let me go ahead and talk a little bit about it. The Turning Point Anywhere software is a standalone application that does not integrate with anything else whatsoever. It doesn't integrate with anything, but it will run in conjunction with anything. So basically, we can be doing anything on our computer. We can have just a desktop up. We can be running a video. We can be on a PowerPoint, PDF, web page. It doesn't matter. We can bring this Turning Point Anywhere application over top of anything else that we're working with and always use it in a polling environment. So at this time, we'll go ahead and open up that Turning Point Anywhere application. And what you're going to notice is that it just opens up this floating show bar that appears in the upper right-hand corner of my page. Now, with this floating show bar, as you can see, it appears over top of anything else. And I can drag it anywhere on the screen that I wish. Now, with my training today, I'm going to talk about this Turning Point Anywhere being used in three separate environments. The first environment in which somebody would use Turning Point Anywhere is very basic, very informal. And that's if you just want to ask your students or participants a verbal question. So if I just want to ask individuals in the audience a verbal question, I don't need to have anything prepared ahead of time. I can just go ahead, open up the application, ask the question, open and close polling to see the results automatically. The second environment that we're going to go ahead and discuss is using Turning Point Anywhere over top of another application. So if we're using it over top of another application, we have the opportunity of generating reports with screenshots where we can see exactly what was on the screen at the time the polling shut down. And then the third environment that we're going to talk about today is using what's called a question list. So if any of you are familiar with our flagship product, which is Turning Points, you know that you build the questions in advance through slides. Well, we're not building any slides here, but we do build the questions in advance through the Turning Point Anywhere software. And of course, some of the ancillary things that we'll cover today is the hardware. So we'll talk about response cards. We'll also talk about the receivers. And we're also going to go ahead and discuss how to create a participant list to track individual student or participant results. All right, so let's get right to that first environment, and that is asking verbal questions. So right now, I do have a receiver plugged into my USB ports. And sitting right in front of me, I have four response cards. So let's take about the, talk about the scenario where I just asked my participants a verbal question. And after the verbal question is asked, I'm going to come up here to my floating show bar and click on what's called the play button, which is to the far left-hand side. It's basically just a right pointing arrow. When I click on this button, you can now see that polling has opened up. So with this verbal question, each person in the audience is going to go ahead and click one button on their response card to respond to the question. As soon as they do respond to the question, I can see the response is coming in in real time. Once I can see that everybody has responded to the question, the same button that I opened up polling with, I'm now going to click on to shut down polling. So as soon as I click on the close button, you can now see that the results do appear over top of anything else. Now my results are appearing over top of the entire screen. Keep in mind that this can be adjusted. So if you shrink this down to appear maybe half of the screen, that's the way that it's always going to appear. Okay, so I have mine appearing full screen, but it won't look like that if you don't want it to. That can be adjusted. But to recap again, I just plugged in my receiver. My participants had a response card. I asked a verbal question. I manually opened the polling by clicking the play button. They responded to it. And the same button that I opened polling with, I clicked to close polling and it automatically showed up the results on the screen. Now, sticking with this same environment, if I just ask another verbal question and open up the polling, I have a tab just to the right of this called Charts. If I click on Charts, this gives me the opportunity of seeing the results coming in as my students or participants are answering the question. So as they're answering the question, I can see the fluctuation of the results. So this is something called dynamic polling. Now, this doesn't shut down the polling. My polling is still open at this time. So it's going to take the click of that tab, which is the close tab, and now this will give you my static results. So this is the charts button where I can see the results coming in in real time once the polling opens up. Are there any questions so far in terms of just asking verbal questions where you can manually open the polling, manually close the polling, and you see the results appear automatically? 
Okay. You guys, I am getting a little bit of background noise. It sounds like with the computer. So if you wouldn't mind possibly putting it on mute if you're able to, really appreciate that. Thank you. Now, we're still going to stick with this verbal questioning environment. So let's say I just asked another verbal question, and I'm going to click my play button. So polling is opened up. When polling is open on a question, in the lower left-hand corner of this show bar, I have something called a main menu drop-down arrow. When I click this, this is basically where all of my functionality is located within the Turning Point Anywhere software. A few things that I want to go ahead and point out from here. The first thing being the countdown timer. So I can insert a countdown timer when polling is opened up on a question, which is going to set a limit to how long the participants have to answer this question. So if I click on the countdown, okay, now it now brings it in. Okay. And with this countdown timer, set, right? can you guys hear this? Yes, yeah, we're going to hear you loud and clear. Here. All right, okay. with the countdown timer, this is functional. So we can go ahead and add five seconds if necessary. We can go ahead and subtract. And we can also go ahead and click a pause button to allow the participants a little bit more time to respond to the question. But of course, when this countdown timer reaches zero, it's going to automatically shut down my polling and display my results. Now, we're going to go ahead and pause it right now. Hold on one second, please. Okay, so we have it paused right now, and there are a couple other things I want to go ahead and display with this drop-down menu. The first thing is coming down to where it reads View, and over on the right-hand side, I have a drop-down menu, and I can go ahead and insert what's called a response grid. With the response grid, I can see who has currently responded to this question. So right now, since I am not using what's called a participant list where individuals are responding, it's just displaying the device IDs on the back of the card. And as each device responds to the question, the box correlating with that device is going to go ahead and light up, which gives me confirmation that they have responded to it. If I were using something called a participant list, instead of showing device IDs, I'm going to be able to see individual names. Now also with this drop-down menu, coming down the view, I have something called a non-response grade. This does just the opposite. It's going to start with everybody in there. And as individuals respond to the question, the name or device ID associated with them will disappear. So only the individuals who have not yet responded will remain in this response grid. Okay, so we'll go ahead and continue with the polling here. It's going to reach zero, and it's going to go ahead and shut it down. And we automatically get the results. Okay, guys, so I do want to recap real quick, and you're going to find out that I recap quite a few times because I like to make sure that there is no gaps in terms of uh, what it is that we're covering. And if there are, I do urge you to go ahead and ask questions. You know, we can make this very informal if you'd like. So first of all, we plugged in a receiver to the USB ports. I have four response cards in front of me. Practical situation, the participants out there will all have their own response card. I ask a verbal question. I manually open up the polling. When polling is open, I could click the charts button, which shows me results coming in in real time. Also, when polling is open, I can insert this countdown timer, which sets a limit, and I can also insert a response in a non-response grid, where if I am using a participant list, I can see right now who has responded to the question and who has not yet responded. Shut down polling when I get the results, and of course, if I had any results, I would see it appear automatically right over top of anything else that I have open on the screen. Any questions at this point in terms of asking verbal questions, inserting countdown timers, or inserting those response or non-response grids? Now, when your presentation is 100% complete, so let's say I'm all done, I just asked three or four questions, now I need to continue on and click the drop-down menu and come down to where it reads session. Remember this, I'm asking verbal questions, so technically, my software has no idea what those verbal questions actually were. So I can come over here to where it reads Session Viewer, and when I click on Session Viewer, notice that it reads Question 1, Question 2, and Question 3. That's because I opened and closed polling three times. So if I wanted to, I could type out each one of those questions, type out each one of those answer choices, and set a correct and incorrect answer choice if I wanted to. This is not something that's frequently accessed, but if you wanted to, you could come back in after the verbal questions 
and insert this information. Regardless whether or not you access the session viewer, when your presentation is complete, you're going to do something called save the session. Saving the session basically means save the results. So if you need to save the session, you click in the main menu drop down, coming down here to session, and at the bottom of this right hand drop down menu I have save session. Saving the session once again means saving the results. So we can save it to the default location which is the sessions folder, or as you can see through my drop down, I can save the results of this presentation any other place that I want to. It doesn't matter where the results get saved to, we just want to make sure it's a consistent location. Any questions right now in terms of when the presentation is over, accessing the session viewer if you want to, or saving the results through Save Session? After we save results, either immediately or at a later time, we can generate reports. To generate reports, the only thing that we must do is open up the Turning Point Anywhere application. Once it opens, we're going to click the main menu drop down and scroll down to where it reads Tools. And the first thing on the right hand side reads Reports. So when I click on Reports, I first of all want you to notice on the left hand side, it gives me the option to choose my saved session. Remember again, the word session means results. So if I save it to the default location, I'm going to see it listed below. If I save it to some other location, I have the option of loading it in through the tab in the lower left hand corner. Here's my current session, so I'm going to keep it highlighted. And now I have what's called available reports in the top middle of the screen. If I click on this, it gives me my drop down. And from the drop down menu, I can choose the type of reports that I want to generate. Now the first two individual results and individual score, those are going to be very nice reports to generate if indeed I am using a participant list where I'm tracking those individual results. Although I am not using one yet, in fact I haven't even talked about it yet, but we will get there. The third option down is results by question. If this is the one that I want, then I'm just going to click on it, and it automatically generates this report. Now since I did not go ahead with the session viewer, it's not showing me what the questions actually were, it's just displaying it as question one, two, and three, and it's showing me how my participants answered. This does generate into HTML. In the upper right hand corner, we have the opportunity to print this if we want. And we also have the opportunity to save it either as an HTML or a CSV file. Any questions at all on generating those reports? Okay, let's kind of tie this all together with the verbal questions. After you're done asking the verbal questions, you have the option of coming down to the session viewer and adding in the questions and the answer choices. Whether or not you do this, a consistent step is going to be to save your results. So you're going to save the session. And then you're going to finally generate reports either immediately or at a later time. If you save it to the default, it's listed to the left. If you save it someplace else, you import it over to the Load Session tab. And you pick from any of these top six reports that we have here. All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and move along to the second topic, which is using Turning Point Anywhere in conjunction with another application. Now before I do this, since we are talking about a different environment, I'm going to reset my session because I don't want to build on my verbal question. And now what I'd like to do is go ahead and open up a PowerPoint presentation. So let me find a good PowerPoint to go open up here. We'll open up the psychology of audiences. Now what you're going to notice is that when my PowerPoint opens up, it automatically also opens up Turning Point. Turning Point doesn't work like that though if you're familiar with it. If you just have a PowerPoint, that's what you want to open up. So notice once again that it is appearing over top of this. It's appearing over top of any application. So you could be running your PowerPoint presentation, and when you're ready to go ahead and pull your audience, you can go ahead and drag this on the screen or maximize it. And if there was a question on here, as always, I'm going to click the play button to open the polling. I still have the option of clicking the charts tab so I can see the results coming in in real time. And yes, I still have the option of putting in the countdown timer, and I still have the option of putting in the response or non-response grid. These are consistent things with Turning Point Anywhere. Our participants would respond to the question. After they respond to the question, I'm going to shut down my polling. I'm going to see my results. Of course, I have them displaying full screen. If you just minimize this after the first time you poll, that's going to be the way it will always display. Keep that in mind. 
Okay, so I'm using this over top of a PowerPoint. So I don't need to necessarily build questions in in Turning Point, if you're familiar with that. I can just use any PowerPoint, and on those question slides where they're just PowerPoint, I can use the Turning Point Anywhere application. Now let's talk about using Turning Point Anywhere over a different type of application, maybe a web page. So if I log on to Internet Explorer, it's going to take me to my home page, which is MSN. Once again, we're still over top of this. So if I open up polling, I can be asking a question based on searching for stars born in October. Who knows? Participants would respond to the question. I shut down the polling. I see the results automatically. Now the whole reason I'm showing you this is because in just a moment, I'm going to generate a report with screenshots. So I can see exactly what was on the screen at my time that the polling shut down. Let's take this logically, though. When you're done with the presentation, where you use Turning Point Anywhere with con in conjunction with something else, maybe a PowerPoint, maybe a web page, maybe a PDF, or whatever else it is you have going on on that screen, you're now going to click on the Main Menu drop-down arrow. From the Main Menu drop-down, you still have the option of coming down here to Session in Session Viewer. And it's still listening as Question 1 and 2. My software still has no clue what the questions were. It doesn't know it was being run over top of a PowerPoint. It doesn't know that the second question was over top of MSN. It doesn't know that. So I have the option of typing out the question and the answer choices and also setting a correct answer if I want to. Once again, regardless if I access the session viewer, I'm going to save my results through Save Session. Consistent step right here. Save it to the Sessions folder or any other location we want to. We just need to go through Save Session to save the results. The last step, either done immediately or at a later time, is generating the reports. Now this time, since I was running this over top of another application, I'm going to generate a results by question report with screenshots. So if I click on this, I can now see exactly what was on the screen at the time that polling shut down. So I don't necessarily even need to go through the session viewer if this was the question that I had on the slide. I can see the results right here. So it's kind of a wasted step sometimes. And if we cruise down a little bit further, of course, we can now see the MSN page. And it even eliminates the chart. So now the only thing that we're looking at is exactly what was on the screen at the time that polling shut down. And this is running it over top of another application. Are there any questions on that second environment, which is running it in, in, in conjunction, excuse me, or whatever you want to refer to, running it over top of another application? Okay, let's move along to our third environment in which Turning Point Anywhere can be used in. And this is if we want to go ahead and load the questions into the software ahead of time. So if this is the case, I'm going to first of all go ahead and reset this session. I'm just going to go ahead now and not build on the previous questions. If I want to build something called a question list, I'm obviously not going to have any students or participants sitting in front of me. And I don't need any hardware with me. To build a question list, I'm just going to open up the software. I'm going to click my main menu drop-down, and I'm going to scroll down to where it reads question. And to the right-hand side, I want to go ahead and build a new question list. So when I click on new question list, this is extremely intuitive from here. You can see that question one, it just wants me to go forward, type out whatever the question is, type out the answer choices. With the tab down here at the bottom, we can add up to 10 possible answer choices. I do want to focus your attention to the right, where it says Question Properties. I know this is very tough to read, but the first option I have here is Anonymous. If I were to be using a participant list where I'm tracking individual results, if I check mark Anonymous, that means that for this particular question, I'm not going to be able to see how each individual answered it. I'm only going to be able to track how the group answered it. I can also set a correct point value and an incorrect point value if I'm tracking this for assessment purposes. Down below, I have presentation properties. I have a box that I can check mark to display a correct answer. This is going to go ahead and display something called a correct answer indicator, which will be visual confirmation as to which answer choice was correct when polling shuts down. I can also go ahead and insert a countdown timer. And the countdown timer sets a limit. So you know that we can insert a countdown timer when polling is going on. We can also insert one ahead of time so it automatically appears when we're building a question list. In the upper left-hand corner, we have the option of adding questions. We can add multiple choice, fill in the blank, or numeric. 
and we're just going to go ahead and build the question list just like that. Now I already have a question list created so I'm not going to go through the process of creating another one. But when we get done creating the question list we have a save tab in the upper right hand corner. We want to make sure that we save this question list to a consistent location. Any questions in terms of building a question list? Now when the students or participants come into your room and you're ready to go ahead and run the presentation, as always you plug in the receiver, open up the software, and the next thing you'll do is go ahead and load this question list. So I'm going to click my main menu drop down, come down the question, this time I'm going to load it, click on the list that I want, and you're going to notice that the first question appears in my floating show bar. Notice below that it still says polling closed, and to the right of it, it reads one of three. That means there's three questions in the list. Now, obviously, my students or participants can see the question from here, but that's not going to be good enough, though. We want them to see the question full screen. So as soon as I open up my polling, it's now going to place that floating show bar in the upper right-hand corner, and we'll display the question full screen. As always, my participants would respond to it. I'm going to shut down my polling manually, and I'm going to see my results. Now, we don't have to close this question list in terms of clicking out of this box before we open up polling again. As soon as we open up polling a second time, it automatically goes to the next question in the list. Once again, participants respond. And I, I want you to, to be aware, and I want to note, that you can always access this charts button to see the results coming in in real time. You can always click this main menu drop down and put in a countdown timer. And you can always go to view and insert this response in non-response grid. These are always things you can do. It doesn't matter of the environment. These are all items that you can always access. Shut down the poll and get the results as always. Now, when you're 100% done with this question list, Another consistent step, and I know I'm a broken record, but that's a good thing because much of these steps are consistent regardless of the environment. You're going to save your results. So you're clicking your main menu drop down, going to session, and you're going to save the session. Save it to a consistent location. Just go through the save session tab to do this. And finally, you're going to go ahead and generate your reports. So go to reports, under available reports, when this time we generate a results by question, since we're using the question list, we're going to be able to see those questions automatically. So this is your third environment where you're using a question list, you build the questions in ahead of time, and then you load them as the participants or students come into the room. How are we doing out there, guys? Are we okay with the three different environments, verbal questions, running in in conjunction with another application, or using a question list? So now let's go ahead and change gears, and the next thing that I want to talk about is the turning point hardware. So to talk about the turning point hardware, I'm going to go ahead and open up a presentation that's going to display the response cards and also the receiver. Okay, so with the response cards, and we'll go ahead now and we'll close this momentarily and we'll display this slide full screen. We have three basic response cards. Going from left to right, we have the XR response card that will allow for fill-in-the-blank short response answers. It also allows for self-paced testing. We have the RF LCD scar card, which gives you answer confirmation, signal strength, battery life, and also channel confirmation. And we have the standard RF response card, which works identical to the RF LCD, just the exception that you don't have the LCD screen right in the middle. Now, is there anybody in my class today who is going to be using the XR response card and is still a little bit unclear how to actually work through this card? All right, then. We're going to go ahead and talk about the RF LCD and the standard RF response card. The great thing about this hardware is that as soon as Turning Technologies delivers it to you, every single one of these response cards, clickers, whatever you're calling them, including every single receiver, which you see down here at the bottom middle, are all set to the same identical radio frequency channel. Now, what this means, that if you're going to be the only one who is using Turning Point Anywhere within a 200-foot range at a given time, this is nothing but a plug-and-play system. 
The only time that it's not plug and play is if somebody else is within 200 feet of you and they're using the same turning point channel. If they're using the same channel as you, there's a possibility of getting cross interference with the signals. In other words, somebody in my room click a button and the responses would go to your computer. This is something that we must avoid. So if this is the case, we need to change the channel on both the receiver and each one of these response cards. Now I'm going to first of all talk about how to change the channel on the response card and then I'll talk about how to change the channel on the receiver. So with these RF response cards, remember they do function the same way as the RF LCD. The only difference is don't have the LCD screen right in the middle. These response cards come set automatically to a default channel and that is channel 41. So as soon as you receive it, it's in your hand, it's already on channel 41. If you need to change the channel to get on a different frequency, you can do this through a three-step process on this response card. To initiate this, we can click the CH button one time in the lower left-hand corner. Our next step is to type out our channel. Our third and final step is to click the CH button again. So it's CH, type out the channel, and then CH. On this standard RF response card, when we do receive a new channel successfully, we have a light in the upper left-hand corner that's going to turn green momentarily and then shut off. This is our indication that the channel change has been successful. We also have a LCD screen right in the middle for those cards, which will give you visual confirmation as to which channel you're currently set to. So they're set to channel 41, but if you need to change the channel because somebody else within 200 feet is also using that same channel, it is done on a three-step process on each individual card. Are there any questions on changing the channel on the response cards? All right, now if I change the channel on my response yes, was there a question? Kevin, Kevin, sorry, yeah. I have one question. Um, I heard about a new remote that you have coming out that has an alphabet on it, like true. We do have we do have a new remote coming out. It's called the uh, response card NXT. That response card NXT is basically going to eventually replace the XR response card that you saw on the left-hand side of that slide. And um, that response card would allow you know, the same things as the XR in terms of fill-in-the-blank short response, essay-style questions, and also self-paced testing through the testing point software. But it's a lot more intuitive to work through. It's a lot more seamless. Yeah. Now, we okay. also have something else called responseware, where students or participants could use their cell phone to respond to questions, which would also permit fill in the blank and short response, and that's currently out right now. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Now, we're changing channels right now, so I just changed the channel on the response cards. Talked about that. But we must ensure that the receiver is on the same channel as the response cards, because otherwise we won't have any communication between the two. So let's say that my response card was on 41, and I just changed it over to, let's say, 47. Well, look at the channel that my Turning Point Anywhere is currently on. That's channel 45. I now need to change the channel on the receiver to get it on the same channel as the response card. To do this, I'm going to click my main menu drop-down, and I'm going to scroll down to where it reads Tools. From Tools, it gives me a drop-down menu, and I'm going to go all the way down to Settings. In the Settings, where I need to go next is in the upper left-hand corner to where it reads Response Device. So I'll left-click on this. Now I have a new category to the right-hand side called Response Card Channels. Now since I do have a receiver plugged in, it's registering it with the identification. And also, over to the right-hand side, it's displaying what channel it's currently set to. Well, if I know all my response cards have been changed to 47, I now need to change this receiver to be on the same channel. So I can click the drop-down, and I could change this receiver anywhere between channel 1 all the way down to 82. Since I'm going to 47, that's what I want to click on. Now the channel change will be successful. Keep in mind that the receiver must be plugged in for this channel change to be successful. Click Done. Now my receiver has been changed over to channel 47. So you can change either one first. You can either change the receiver first and then the response cards, or change the response cards first and then the receiver. But we want those both on a consistent channel. So if we're both on channel 47, then we want to make sure that we change it off the colleague, but both the response cards and the receiver need to be on the same channel to communicate with each other. 
Any questions at all in terms of the hardware, changing the channel on either the response card or the receiver, or when this would need to be done? All right, next I'm going to go ahead and talk about my final topic, which is building participant lists. So if you want to build a participant list, this would give you the opportunity to track individual responses within your presentation. So if you notice from my reports, I had two individual style reports, individual score and individual um, percentage, I believe. And with those two, I must be using a participant list to go ahead and generate. Now, if I need to build that participant list, I, of course, do not need any hardware with me. All I need is to open up the software. And once I do this, I'm going to click my main menu drop down and scroll down over top of where it reads participants. And in the second option down, I'm coming over here to where it reads Create Participant List. When I click on this, it now prompts me to go through a series of five steps to successfully create the list. Step number one, it just wants me to select a template. Once I do this, I click Next. Step number two, I have my list fields. Or in other words, what information is it that I want to see within my participant list? Now by default, since I kept it on the education template, I have last name, first name, and student ID. If I decide that I do not want the student ID, a double click, we'll take it out of there, or I can go ahead and highlight, like the minus sign, it also takes it out of there as well. Same thing on the left, if there's something that I want to see in the participant list, I can highlight it and go ahead and bring it in. Once I have all the information that I want within the participant list, I'm now going to go ahead and click my next tab. My third step is to name this participant list. So if I'm teaching English 551, that's what I want to name it. Next, I'm going to click Finish. I'm going to decide a location it is I want to save it to, and click the Save tab. After I click the Save tab, it's going to bring me to my fifth and final step, and this is where I can add participant information into the list. Basically, this is where I'm aligning each participant with the response device. Now to get more columns and rows to add more participants, all I'm doing is clicking the Enter tab on my computer. And I want you to notice, first of all, how I have a column for last name, because that was the only thing I had left from step two, which was my list fields. Now automatically, I also have a column for device ID. From here, I have a very important decision to make. I can either go ahead and pre-assign each individual a response card by putting in the device ID of that card and matching it up with the individual, or I can keep the column for device ID completely blank. And as the individuals come into my presentation, they can pick up any card they want to. And I would access something called the real-time registration tool, where they can basically register the card and use it for that presentation, or they can permanently assign themselves that card if that's how you want to facilitate it. So the two options are to pre-assign the cards through filling out the device ID right now. If we do that, the participants must pick up that exact card or we can keep the caller for device ID blank and they can pick up whatever card they want to. So let me first of all go ahead and put in four simulated last names. Now of course if you have this saved to a roster, a very easy method is just to simply copy and paste. You can copy and paste the entire thing by the way, it doesn't have to be one name at a time. Now if I make the decision that I want to pre-assign these cards, I'm going to first of all pick up one card and turn it over to the back. Right below the barcode will be the device ID. So the card I have in front of me has a device ID, 1DEC56. This is always six digits. This is always numbers 0 through 9 and letters A through J. So if this was a real list that I'm creating, Herr Holtz has just been assigned this response card. That means that each time I'm using this participant list, Herr Holtz must pick up this exact card because I'm pre-assigning the card to him right now. I would go through the same process for each participant who I'm going to have in the list. This is the first way to create it by pre-assigning the response cards. Are there any questions on that first way to create the list? Now the second way to create the participant list still involves going through those five steps, although this time we're keeping the column for device ID 100% blank. We're coming down to the lower right hand corner, clicking the Done tab, and that list is saved. So now let's get to a scenario when we're ready to run the presentation. By the way, you are going to be getting a one-page eight-step document. And that first step is always going to be to plug in the receiver. Next step is going to be to open up the Turning Point Anywhere software. 
And your third step is to select a participant list if indeed you're going to be using a list. So myself, I want to use a participant list. So I'm going to click my drop down, go down to participants, and I want to load a participant list. I'm going to click browse. And I know I saved this in my participants folder and I called it English 551. So there it is. I now double click and this list is engaged to use with this presentation. Now, if I've already assigned each participant a response device to the device ID, I'm ready to move on and run the presentation. Load a question list if I need to, ask the verbal questions, or running it over top of another application. Just move along. But I didn't do that, though. I kept that column for device ID 100% blank. So now I have some additional steps, actually one additional. And this is to click my main menu dropdown, go back down to participants, and comes to the second option from the bottom, which reads Real-Time Registration Tool. When I select this, it now opens up my participant list and will show my first 10 participants. And it's going to list them 1 through 9 and 0. To open up this registration tool, I click on the Open Close tab in the upper right-hand corner. Now, my first 10 participants in the list are going to find where they're located and click on the corresponding button on the response card. For instance, if my last name is West, I can see I'm number three in the list. Therefore, I'm clicking button number three on my response card. When I click button number three on my response card, it's now going to go ahead and automatically assign that device ID. Okay, so let me go ahead and change the channel on the cards that I have in front of me here. Button number three has just been pushed. And if I'm West, it's now automatically registered my device ID to use with this participant list. If my last name is Smith, I'm clicking button number two. Goldman's going to click four. Hareholtz is going to click one. Now, do notice how it's only showing the first ten. So if you have 30 people in a participant list, it's still going to show up just like this. But after 15 seconds, it's going to rotate to the second ten but they will still be listed as 1 through 9 and 0 because that's how the cards are represented. There's no such thing as an 11, 12, or 13 on these response cards. Now, if you want to go ahead and pause it to allow people more time to register their card, this tab in the lower middle will do that. You can also advance it to the next screen or go back to a previous screen if you want to. The real-time registration tool, though, is very nice if you don't want to pre-assign the cards. If you don't want to go through the process, of finding those device IDs and typing them out, or if you just want to allow people to pick up whatever card they want, but you still want to be tracking individual results, this is a great tool for exactly that. Now, once everybody has registered their card, you're going to X out of it. It's going to ask you, do you want to save the changes? And you say yes. You're now ready to run your presentation. The whole point of doing all this running participant list is when you generate reports, Notice that we do have individual results and individual score. So you can track each individual for assessment purposes. You can see their name, and you can see how they performed on the presentation. Are there any questions at all on creating these participant lists, either by pre-assigning the cards or going through the real-time registration tool? All right, ladies and gentlemen, are there any questions at all on absolutely anything that we covered in today's presentation?